So I, I mentioned this in passing. Now it's time to uh, drill into the details here. 3JS lets us define materials. I, I killed your pen. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, but I, there was a, wasn't there another pen right there? You can yeah, you just use that one. I destroyed it by accident. I was I don't know, <laughs> trying to draw a picture for this fellow here, and I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, so these, these materials are, you know, essentially the way that the surface properties of objects we draw are represented in 3JS. The word material is a term from 3D graphics quite common. It does mean kind of what the outer look of a mesh is going to be. Because remember, under the covers, it's really just this chicken wire, this set of triangles that we then give some surface look to, right? Um, we've seen basic material in action when we had the unlit cube. We saw fong when we lit it. And there's more. And now we have a little uh, uh, sampler where we can go through and look at these. And it's in there in chapter four, three just materials. You can play with it. We'll talk through a few bits of it. And then, one second, sorry. Now we'll do a lab real quick. Here we go. No, not that. No, no. The hard way. All right, so what we're seeing here, ooh, I got some bad non-responsive layout action happening here. I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Oh, that's all. Clipping. Yeah, don't even try and run this on an iPad. Probably just blow up. Not to mention the WebGL won't work. That's a different story. That's this afternoon's session. All right, so basically a way to tweak some properties here. Wow, what is that? Um, and you can start playing with it. So here's a Fong shader. This is the one we looked at where we're getting these sharp lit highlights. And we can do more than that. There, there are different properties you can pass to these shaders. Diffuse color is the main color. That's the one that's reflecting diffuse lighting off the surface of the object. There's a secondary color, which is a wonderful thing called a specular color, which it's not coming out so well there. It's coming out much better on the monitor than it is here. You see that purple now? I made a purple specular color using my jQuery color picker. Let me pick another color. It's even more purpler. How's it looking? Where is it? You guys can see that change, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's just, we're changing the specular color of this built-in thing, material, in different ways. But, you know, that's a, that's a, yes? So it looks like there's some, so it's not just like a texture. Is that a displacement map? Also? It is not a displacement map. We're going to get to that in the very next section. Um, this is just a nicely detailed texture of the surface of the moon. Are, there are no other features on there. This is just bits in a texture. Um, but, and, and you can see the nice shading. I mean, this is the thing. The lighting's coming from over there toward here. And so with the diffuse light, we can see the shading on the back. And this is where these normals come into play. Let me show you this drawn in wireframe mode. If you set the wireframe mode of a material in 3JS, it will render it for you. And so we're seeing the quads that make up a sphere, right? Remember I was talking about those normals before when we were constructing the circle geometry? Can I turn the animation off on this? I can't. Um, imagine a vector coming off that rectangular face going that way. So the normal vectors are pointing this way on this side of the sphere, and they're pointing that way on that side of the sphere. Um, and so the angle between where the light's coming from and where that normal's pointing is so big over here that these faces are shaded darker. And the stuff facing the light is shaded brighter, which is why we saw those bright highlights on the right side of the sphere from our point of view, and that is because the light's coming from over here, okay? And that's why we're seeing the specularity, these extra reflective highlights with that specular color coming off of there. You know, that's kind of wonderful. Here's the thing, though. That's not what the moon really looks like, right? You know, it's, it's got something called an albedo. It's got a reflective brightness off of it. It really diffuses the light coming off it much more uh, regularly and without sharp highlights. So there's another material in the 3JS library that it comes with called Lambert. Lambert's nice. So that's like really simulating lighting that's just bouncing off the object equally in all directions. It doesn't have sharp highlights. The specular color is actually ignored now. Not can use it because it's not part of this lighting model. Or we can go basic and unlit. Now we see with no lighting on it, 
This is the texture map and what it looks like. You were asking about the texture map for the moon. That's what it really looks like. Um, in the, this is a 3JS sphere object, okay. and the sphere object code generates those UVs, those texture coordinates. It knows okay. that the texture coordinates for the faces up here are different from the texture coordinates of the faces down here. And that's, you know, this is the upper part of the texture. This is the lower part of the texture. And our texture is a square. The texture is a square image. So the UV coordinates, and there's, you know, there's distortion up here as well. I mean, basically, the texture coordinates at the poles are going to be the very center of the top of the texture map and the very center of the bottom of the texture map, right? So that's all done with trigonometry inside 3JS's sphere generating code. You don't have to tell it. If you use 3JS, say sphere, texture map, done. It's that easy. JPL's website's got all the astro astronomy textures, tons of them. All uh, Creative Commons or public domain. I mean, check the licensing. But it's, you know, again, if you were building a solar system, you get all the textures you need, dude. Yeah. If you want to build a blazing sun, actually, my first book I wrote, I had a, a sun example of this. Then we're going to use a shader to do that, and that's a little bit different. You're not really using the textures of images of the sun. Um, you're playing some visual tricks, and you can do all kinds of fun things there. But for the, for the satellites and for the planets, there's a lot of great imagery on JPL. Okay, yeah, and let's see. I turn the texture off, and here's what my sphere looks like. You can still see the shading in Fong mode. There's my wireframe, right? And I think it played with every aspect of what you can do with materials in this sampler. So let's do a lab. So um, chapter four, there should be a, a template file, materials-template.html, which is vanilla. And you should be able to throw by copy and paste a few lines of code in there to do a few different things. That this doesn't have all the sophistication of that sampler with all the controls in it. I was showing you before with being able to add change material. So we're just literally just going to copy and paste a few lines to create specific ones just to get a feel. So how would you use the 3JS API to make a blue Fong shaded sphere? And between those two files, you should have all the code you need. And a couple lines of copy and paste, and this should take you three or four minutes at the most. Please grab me if you have questions. And the net result should look like the following. Yeah, so the template's got the UI in it, but it doesn't have all the jQuery and other stuff wired up. So just a place for you to dump code. Am I got it yet?
Getting close. Need more time? Need more time. I'm fine. For your reference, it's Fong shaded, remember, and it's blue. You got a blue circle. You sure you're using the right material? If it's a blue circle, then you're probably using the basic material. Because you're using Fong? Yeah, the Fong material should give you these shading highlights because the template should already have the light in it. Yeah, file save helps. Unless you've got a little magic I don't know about. Let's see what the template. Yeah, so in the template, we started with a basic material, right? Yeah. All right, folks, so we should have this by now. The template started with a basic material, so we had to make the one line change to change it from basic to fong. And then we get that nice shading because we already had a light in the scene. What? And what did the template have in it? Was it white? Template had it white. Thank you very much. Yeah, so also has to have the color changed to blue or whatever you'd like. Everyone got that? Good to go? Next. Uh, next. Let's add a texture map to it. That same blue funk shaded sphere. You can use the texture map of your choice, but there's already code to load the moon in the template, I think. Let me verify that. No, you got to pull that out of the full sampler code, which is here. So more copy-paste. There's texturing code. Here we go. So. So we're going to take that blue funk shaded sphere and add a texture to it. So just going to edit that same file you're making and load a texture and add it to the material. And you should get something that looks like this. A blue moon. Da -da 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 -da. That's a song for us old people. I know that song. So the material is affecting the light? The material and the light together determine what the surface properties look like. Um, so it's not affecting the light, it's affecting the shading on the object. And as someone figured out in our first, one of our first labs, you can change the light color to affect some of the stuff too. You can change both and get some really interesting results. If you make a yellow light on this blue moon, for example.
right now we have the like light on the whole thing. Um, but could you add the light specifically to one of these three objects? No, it's something you might really want to do. Um, 3JS doesn't let you light specific subparts of the scene using these techniques. You'd have to create sh specific shaders and pass, it, pass some specific lighting objects. And you could get that effect. And sometimes you want that. Maybe you only want to turn on lights that affect a certain part of the scene, for example. A um, little more complicated than what we can get into here. But absolutely within the bounds of what you can do with a, with a few extra uh, contortions. Um, but if you also just want to light specific parts of the scene and not, not per object but just areas of the scene, then you'd use spotlights or point lights that would only affect a range. We might have a lab about that if we got time to get to it before lunch. Yeah. Everyone got their texture map, Blue Moon? Anyone having problems with that? Yes? Who's, who said that? Where are you? Okay. Let's see. What's, let me come over and just look with you before I give away the answer. All right. So all you need to, now you needed the material, okay. right? So you had a, you already had a material to do your blue blue sphere, right? Did you create the blue funk shaded sphere from the previous lab? Right. So all you need to do now is add a texture map to that same material. No, I mean you literally. No, no. You okay. just need to steal the code from the original example. This okay. one that sets up a texture, yeah. loads the texture. So if you search for the URL map URL, right? Yeah. right? You need that, and then you need the load texture line here, right? And then you'll have a texture that you then set into the material. And there's a, something that'll set it. Oh, I was just creating material. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Any old where, yeah, it's, it's an initialized thing, so you can do it anyway. Yeah. You don't need that, even. I mean, you really just need to create the texture, one line there. Just map, map. See this? Oh. That's what loads the texture map. All this other stuff is just, um, that's just some machinery inside so the user interface can change to different materials. So you don't need all that level of nonsense, right? Now, but you need to now, you've, you've loaded it. Mm -hmm. Now you have a, an image, a texture map object. Yeah. You need to now connect it to the material. So find the code that creates the material, right? And you're going to set its map property. If you look down here at how it's done, search for dot map. Oh, not dot map. Search for a col uh, map colon. It's a JSON object thing. That's it. So the way we do that is we pass the map parameter along with the other parameters when we create our material. So let's look at the code. And we created that map using three dot texture utils. And it looks like this. It looks like this. So we get the map URL that we define. Let's point to an image file that's loaded by the image utils. And that's, that's a texture map at this point in 3JS land. Um, and then we pass it as the map parameter when we create the material. And we have a texture map on the material. They really do make this stuff pretty easy in 3JS. we got one more lab when it comes to materials. Hopefully this one's easier. How do we make it display in wireframe? There's code again in the original material sampler code. You ought to be able to just steal one line change to get it rolling. See what it looks like on the screen. You notice it's still fong shaded. The, the stuff on the left hand side of the sphere is still appearing darker. Even with wireframe mode on, we're still getting that shading.
yeah, you're still getting the pixels from the texture. You're still getting the shading. Those things are all used in the shader, and the shader just does, it doesn't draw the surface of the triangle. It's just draw, or the quad in this case, it's drawing the outline of the quad. It's a different uh, uh, shader type for that. If you look in the code inside materials, you'll see, um, well, it's actually the same shader. It just takes this wireframe parameter and calculates these edges to draw in the shader. It's kind of nice. Everyone got that? It's just a one-line change. Search for wireframe. And we're going to look now. Right? The library makes it really easy. We just pass in wireframe true with defaults to false. That's set to true. The material rendering code knows how to do all the magic for us. So that's great. Um, we're getting really close to lunch break, so I'm going to plow through the rest of the material in this section. And we're going to just mostly look at it on screen. There's examples to go through each one of these. This is all, you've got this all with the samples. Has anyone not got the PowerPoint deck? Because I, I sent you guys a link to that where you could go download it. There's a zip file. It's in the instructions. You don't have to go get it now, but you know, you've got all this to take away so you can use it for reference later. Um, so someone was asking about this mapping before. This is what's great about all these programmable shaders is you can do really crazy stuff and you can get effects that allow you to simulate physical effects but yet use that same simple geometry. That cube, I mean that cube, that sphere we saw, what did that have? A few hundred vertices in it? Not that much. But by applying multiple textures um, that are combined with the vertices, the shader can then simulate the effect of the bumpy surface we're seeing here by just at using a second texture map that's a bumpiness to it. It's using the pixel values in that texture map to simulate what looks like more vertex data, but it's not. It's just that same simple sphere. And we'll look at that live. A uh, more advanced version of that technique is to use a, a bitmap that defines normal vectors to create that shaded lighting we were looking at, basically at many more points on the sphere so you can get simulated landscape effects, you know, uh, elevation effects and other things that look like they're vertex data, like the millions of vertices you'd need to actually display that sphere with that elevation is done with the same sphere and another texture map combined with the diffuse map. That's the colors of the uh, Earth from space. And then there's a final thing we'll look at, environment mapping. But let's look at this real quick. So now the Earth, uh, the Moon rather, has not only got that diffuse map, but it's got some extra bumpiness on it. I'll turn the texture off so we can see that a little better. Right? Let me just, I'm going to take the lighting down. It's a little low contrast here, so just a second. See? Look at all those bumps, bumpy bumps. Right? What is up with that? That's just a second bitmap. I'm going to look in the source file and we're going to see what that bitmap's name is. And we're going to look at it real quick. We're going to look at it real quick. Come on. There we go. Cloud.png. What does cloud.png look like? Where is my images? images. So this bitmap which was generated probably by some bitmap generation tool out of Photoshop or something. This is a simplex noise or Perlin noise, you know, it uses math, fancy math, to generate some randomness that looks quite naturalistic. And these pixels, based on their diffuse and alpha values, are used to simulate the bumps all along the surface of the moon. I would be lying if I told you what the math looked like to do that, but it's in the shader that does bump mapping. Um, and this simple texture map, and that simple sphere and that simple moon texture, which was 1024 by 1024, are all combined together to give you this great bumpy surface that, you know, add the moon to just add moon. Let me crank the light back up. Bumpy moon. Now, again, you say, you say it's a little crude. Let's go back to the without texture. And we'll see that, you know, 
yeah, it's there. It looks bumpy. It looks cool. If you look at the edge, though, really carefully, there's no bumps on it. It's a complete trick, but it's a pretty good one. We can get even better with normal mapping. That's the next level of detail on this. So get closer, maybe. Closer. Sorry, one sec, guys. Screen is very small. Where's my slider? There it is. So you see how it looks like there's elevation data on Africa there? And see that as it's coming around? Again, if you look at the edge of the sphere, it disappears. So it's a trick of the eye. But it's a pretty damn good one. And the way that's done, this is without normal map. You know, This is without normal map. Now you can see the difference, right? See those elevation details? Appearing and disappearing? No vertex data there. The shader takes what's encoded as RGB values. They're, the RGB is used as 0, 0, 1 vectors defining normals coming off of each triangular face at a higher level of detail than the triangles themselves. Remember in wireframe, there are quads. The wireframe, there weren't that many of them, right? A few hundred, not that many vertices. So in between, along the vertices, you know, based on where the positions you get, we take a normal value. It's an R just encoded as bitmap data. It's much more efficient than trying to encode 3D data. You're just using the RGB channel. Um, and these, there are tools that generate this kind of stuff. I mean, it's a common graphics technique, so you can Photoshop plugins that can generate this from the, I mean, this is the map of the Earth, right? This is exactly like the diffuse map. And then, you know, it, it uses uh, light and dark values to generate elevations, essentially. But they're not elevations, they're normals that simulate elevations. You can do it in both. You can actually change the, the bits in the um, displacement map using you know, Canvas API, for example. And um, so what you do is you create a Canvas element. You would assign that Canvas element to be the texture map. And there's a way to do that. And in, and I don't, and in the book, I cover this. And in, in, in this, uh, you'll see it in the samples in the chapter, tw uh, chapter 11 sample. You're driving a car through a little virtual city. You sit inside the car, and as the car moves, the dashboard animates. The dials on the dashboard, it's actually just Canvas 2D bitmap drawing. But the texture's updated every frame. So that's very cool. So you could do that. You could do it by drawing to 2D Canvas. That could get slow, depending on how many pixels you're pushing. Um, you could also do it in the shader. If you have all the data that w is required to figure this out, and you can feed it to the shader, then it'll be much faster if you compute it on the GPU. So it depends on your application. Um, we're very. Oh, we're at 12:30. If we can take a few more minutes, I think we're getting close to the end of this. Oh yeah, let's look at environment mapping real quick. If you guys, you mind hanging on five more minutes, a little more. Map. <coughs> so look at this. It would appear that my sphere is reflecting the panoramic background. So this is a spherical panel. I might be, I, no, it's a cubic panel. Uh, what that means is we've got six images on the inside of a cube that represent a sky background. Right? Those are stitched together into an apparent continuous background. 3GS has a built-in object to do that. It's called a cube map. We build that cube map as our background, and then we also make it the environment map parameter of the material on this object. And what that does is 3GS a shader for the, if it sees an environment map, will actually take bits out of the cube texture based on you know, the normals to the face. So you know, this part of the face is pointing this way. That means it's pointing that way. It sees the stuff in the cubic map that's out there. And it puts it on here. And it combines it with the other pixels in the texture. And for good measure, um, we add some reflectivity to this stuff. And we see some nice highlights on it. It looks like, you know, basically those are parameters to the shader. If you turn this off, that's, that's all that's underneath, this diffuse white sphere. All right. We can tweak that. All right. And then I'm pretty amazing. I mean, think of the stuff you could do with this. 3GS is built in text objects. You could put, you could do an extruded 3D text with a logo on it at NBC, CBS Broadcasting, and then, you know, put this kind of stuff on it like it's reflecting things from, you know, the background, outer space, whatever. 
And there's uh, tons of examples we can go through together on this. But yeah, and there's more. And we're, I, you know, I don't, we're not going to have time to cover this, because I want to move on to the next section this afternoon. There's still a lot to do. So you know, I apologize. We moved at a, maybe a slower pace than I would have liked, but I think we covered the material at the right pace and right level so far. But if you go through these, you're going to see how we can do lighting, the different point spot ambient and directional lights we talked about before. Um, and in the next section, we can see how we can do real-time shadows. You can run these examples if you want while we're here or during lunch or whatever. We, can, we have a light coming from this way, a spotlight. It can cast shadows in real time. As the objects move, as you move around the scene, the shadows are going to do the right thing. Um, it's a bit of an expensive operation that starts doing extra stuff in the rendering. When, the way shadows work is the renderer will render uh, to an off-screen bitmap and then, then combine that with other stuff in the scene. And it just it adds overhead. But it's an amazing set of effects. So like that car configurator example we looked at earlier, that's basically what's done that way. Uh, it's done that way. And it's just kind of amazing. But it goes beyond this. I'm going to show you this example real quick. Because OK, so that's wonderful. 3JS don't have to create shaders if we don't want to. Um, it gives us those Fong, Lambert, all those things right out of the box. But what if we want to do something extra? I mean, there's no way they're ever going to, the authors of 3GS are ever going to think of everything you might want to render in every way you might want to render it. So just the way you can create your own geometry, like we saw with circle geometry and subclass that, you can create your own shaders. And um, they give you a three-dot shader material. And it's still higher level than going into just pure GLSL, setting up those uniforms and those 50 calls in JavaScript just to set everything up. Um, you create an array and say, these are my uniforms, these are my varying types. You say what types they are, float, or it's a texture, or whatever. And you can then glue it in. It, 3JS knows how to just call the shader and GLS, GLSL and make the right thing happen. So we're going to take a quick look at this example, because it's so kick-ass. This is, this is something called a Fresnel shader. It's spelled. S is silent because of uh, Frenchness. So again, it's cubic environment map. Fresnel is a person, by the way. As I'm moving mouse, I'm not even clicking here. It's just tracking mouse movements. Um, these bubbles are being animated. And each one is shaded with a Fresnel shader. The Fresnel shader is taking, uh, it's sort of like the environment map case. It's taking the cube map. So it knows how to ref reflect these things, but it's a fake reflection. It's, it's indexing into the cube map. But it's also using math to calculate refractions so that you see through to the other side of the cube map that way. But it's distorted the way it would be looking through a bubble. Isn't that amazing? Again, I will remind you, this is a web page. <laughs> so you, know, you put these things together and you know, build up some layers of complexity and you know, maybe some extra engine code on top. With 3JS, and you could start imagining, hey, I could build a video game. I could build a crazy simulation. I could create a water park for people to play around in. I mean, it's all, you know, add some physics in it, as, as one fellow asked. It's all possible now. Um, let's see if there's any code here that's like, worth getting into. One second, I'm sorry. I've got to just text back. Say that again. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the bubbles obscure each other. And then let's go back to that. And you can see that effect, yeah. Um, to do that, what you would do is each bubble shader would actually um, have a camera from which it rendered the scene that's going that way. And so the bubbles you know, behind would be, you know, they would know how to render each other. This is, this is not rendering the live scene onto the surface of each bubble in real time. It's only rendering the contact, contents of this skybox, you know, the background uh, cube map. right? Uh, in order to do it the way you want, these objects would each have to be able to render the scene independently to an off-screen bitmap. And it gets a little bit intensive. I mean, there's a really nice example I saw where there's water surface re re reflecting the scene's contents in real time. But that's one giant mesh. It's not a bunch of these bubbles. If you do that, I think you're creating a lot of off-screen bitmaps. And, it might, you know, it might work on this. It would probably tax a mobile device or whatever. OK, you guys, so um, pretty cool, huh? We can dive into more of this after the break. Break time, lunch time. I got to go get my iPad. I'll see you guys over there.